issue 50 and the director's cut. The director's cut of the story, Supersonic Special Issue 6 of all things, isn't on YouTube for some reason, even though it's the definitive version of the issue. So I guess I'll use the regular version of the story and then show footage from the director's cut version from a different source. Anyways, now for the epic finale, or at least what was originally intended to be the comic's epic finale. I personally think that would have been them ending it way too early to the point of it feeling anticlimactic and rushed, with tons of wasted potential and stuff like Scourge and stuff, so I'm glad it didn't end there. It starts out with a strange looking Robotnik wearing different clothes, so I guess this is some kind of flashback? And he's being threatened by someone calling him Julian, son of Ivo Robotnik. Wait, so Eggman isn't called Ivo in this continuity, but his father is? So is this his father? Stories really shouldn't have such confusing in media res starts. It just makes me think that I somehow missed the story and starts me out lost and confused instead of truly invested. Why aren't I starting out where 49 left off with Sonic, Knuckles, and Jeffrey? Anyways, Robotnik says seeming scared that he thought his scheming had been perfect, so I guess it is Robotnik. By the way, we never, I don't think we ever really find out what that scheming is. And the two people who were shooting lasers at him are revealed to be Jack Carr and Londo. Problem is, I'm only seeing their silhouette so far, and I've long since forgotten if these are names I've heard before. Londo says that the minister guy won't tolerate failure, as I wonder how the hell we went from Eggman ambushing not whole being in full control of the situation to this. Jules? Wait, I know that's the name of Sonic's father. Oh, so is this supposed to be a flashback to before Jules was made a robot? Jules says that he won't find out why if they leave him here, and Charles says that he finds this interesting because somehow he's never seen the Overlanders turn on one of their own. What? How? So now we get introduced to the Overlanders, the humans of the Archie Sonic universe. That's right, Sonic Adventure didn't do it first, this did. They, they could have just called them humans, but I guess Overlander does sound better. Seriously though, I guess the internet and stuff doesn't exist, because how the hell could someone possibly think that Overlanders never commit crimes of violence against their own kind? It's like, like people say that animals don't turn against their own kind, but they do. So it turns out that this is actually the first time that Jules had seen Robotnik, and he and Charles put him to work as an engineer. Why? I mean, shouldn't it be obvious he's in trouble for a good reason? Well, whatever. I guess they're really desperate to have someone helping them in the war against the Overlanders. I wish I had actually known the situation was taking place at this point in time right when the issue started, because that was really confusing. All they needed to do was put in a single tiny text blurb at the start saying, It takes place at this time. After being brought to the king personally, Robotnik explains that as his people rely more on size to intimidate their opponents, naturally since the humans are taller than all of the animal mobians, they are actually quite vulnerable to a direct attack, especially when outnumbered. Wait, why? Anyways, it's because of his knowledge of the Overlanders that he was appointed as Warlord Julian, which Uncle Chuck, back in his unappealing Sonic OC design, complains about, but in one that doesn't explain why he's opposed to it. Is it because of his personality? Because this scene is implying that it's only because he's a human, and I don't think Uncle Chuck is supposed to be like that. Then we cut to some swap bots, with one of them saying that their master must be having a really good dream, and we see Robotnik, who looks like he's encased in metal. And so when I first read this, I assumed that he was roboticizing himself to become more powerful for the epic finale. Okay, under I can understand that he got this idea from Metal Robotnik. Oh, sorry, Robo Robotnik from the other universe. But Robo Robotnik did that to himself reluctantly or desperation when the cyborg freedom fighter is wrecking his face effortlessly. Why would he think that he needs to be driven to this? And now I cut to the director's cut, which explains that, no, Robotnik wasn't roboticizing himself at all. He was just taking a nap. Well, in case in metal for some reason. Robots explain to Eggman that they've secured a test subject as per the instructions. The test subject is an overlander with green hair. 
He's shocked at seeing him, saying that the Overlander thought he was dead and never would have guessed that he became Robotnik. Really? Okay, he looks a little different from what they were used to, cyborg eyes and ears, but they seriously didn't recognize him. He erased him from existence by testing out his ultimate weapon on him, and breaks the snively that once the shipment from Down Under will arrive, he'll be able to unleash his weapon and Mobius will be his. Wait, I thought Mobius already was his. And Snively thinks to himself that he's planning against Robotnik, which I can understand them keeping to the director's cut release a lot later because that would have ruined the surprise that he was plotting against him. Anyways, we then cut to Sonic, Jeffrey, and Knuckles where the issue should have fucking started, and Knuckles is somehow finding out for the first time the news that Sally was supposedly killed by Sonic. Even though it was established earlier that Knuckles can be contacted by radio, which was how Uncle Chuck told him to come over with an emerald. So why wasn't he informed of the news to eliminate any chances of him trying to help Sonic out of ignorance? I mean, I guess the explanation is that he just wasn't around the radio when they were trying to call him. But then SBL grabbed Sonic from behind with being invisible, meaning that he must have already known about the whole situation. So if he knew, why didn't Knuckles? Why didn't he tell Knuckles? I love that after Jeffrey tries to say by order King Acorn, Knuckles basically tells him to shut up, saying, Stuff that pal, I give the orders on the floating island. It's a cool take that against Jeffrey right now, even if Knuckles still isn't siding with Sonic. And just as I started to wonder why Dulcie didn't come in and tell everyone about how she knows Sonic's telling the truth, he does exactly that. She also reveals that dragons cannot tell lies. How the hell does that work? Some sort of magical spell on them all, I guess. How far does that go? How about not telling all of the truth for the purposes of misleading someone? How about only telling some of the truth? You can still mislead someone without technically lying. Is it that they're forbidden from misleading in general? It felt so anticlimactic just how quickly Jeffrey returned to being on Sonic's side without even apologizing right away. Meaning that I'm still kinda mad at him. Instead, he just immediately goes to saying that the real enemy is trying to turn them all against each other, and instead, we must team up. Which sounds so stilted and awkward. Although, at least it's justified in this case because he's embarrassed. Knuckles says that out of respect for Sally, he's going to help Sonic, because that's probably what Sally would have wanted. And he orders SBO to assemble the Chaotix as Island Guardians until he'll get back. I like how they actually thought ahead enough to realize that Dulcie wouldn't fit in a plane. Although, she really shouldn't care because she can fly anyways. While everyone not hold sold to March by Swapbot who say that they'll all be roboticized, Gordon and Tails are hiding, still capable of doing stuff, because Eggman was too stupid to think to chain them to trees, or chain them to the other people being marched by Swapbots. Meaning that even some tribal apes are smarter than Eggman. Gordon says that they have to get to the Bathy Spear so that they can get help from other Freedom Fighter groups. I'd ask why no one has noticed the disappearance of Angela and Bunny yet, but one, there's plenty of commotion distracting them, and two, even I don't usually notice that because there's so many different people in the main character group as it is. Rorder looks on the bright side that at least Robotnik doesn't know about their underground canal system and water vehicles. The underground canal system? If that's what's going to save the day, I don't think they should have just introduced that in the epic finale because it comes off as too convenient. Then someone in silhouette, so that the audience can't tell who it is, shows up out of nowhere in a bullshit diabolic ex machina with a croc-style robot behind him. Which is confusing because those things are supposed to be all the way down under. It's because of that robot that at first glance I thought it was Crockpot talking. He calls Tails a two-tailed freak and orders the two of them back upstairs, as I wonder how he even found this place to begin with. That's another thing that confused me. If this isn't Crockbot, why is he talking like him? Oh, so apparently they had kept Bunny and Antoine's escape from the prison to a director's cut. How is he supposed to know that? And when I first wrote this review, I went on a huge rant about how they didn't bother to show their epic escape, but it turns out they just shunted it over to a version of the story that will only be read a lot later. Maybe non-special issues have page limits so they're forced to do it. Anyways, we continue right where we left off with them, but unfortunately the resolution has been confused as hell. A robot hears Bunny saying that she's fiddling with her collar, 
and an explosion happens that's so bad that it blows out the cell door and damages the guard, who naturally thinks that all the prisoners were killed. However, it turns out that instead Logic took a back seat because someone had gotten Bunny's collar off and she had thrown it while still being able to make it explode. I guess by simply moving the robot parts, because maybe the collar had a psychic connection to robot parts. But if someone, if someone could just take the collar off, then why wasn't the collar taken off earlier? Well, maybe she was just supervised by robots the whole time, so she couldn't do it in front of them. Walt says that it sounds like the rest of the down and under freedom fighters are still alive instead of having been killed. And after I presume they've run out of their cell to make it this far, we see all the Down Under Freedom Fighters together, and the girl, the only one of them I really like, says that they'll create a diversion by taking out Crockpot and his crew. How do they expect to do that without any weapons? And it'll be up to Antoine and Bunny to get themselves to the airbus. I love how Antoine says, Dear Bunny, confirming that they're indeed a couple now. It does sound stilted and awkward though, but since he's still very new to being her boyfriend, it does make sense of him to say that. The last thing we see of the uprising is Bunny bringing Antoine with her using her robot parts. Eggman boasts that once he gets the mineral ore shipped to him from his henchmen dealing with an uprising, his ultimate annihilator will be operational, at which point he'll destroy Nuthole. Pretty pointless at this point since he's already in the process of capturing everyone there anyways. I mean, does he want to destroy them or roboticize them? He returns to his slumber chamber. Wait, so is that why he looked like he was made of metal? That just how he sleeps? Not even lying down? That's a pretty uncomfortable sleeping position, who would want that? Rotor and Tails get rescued from the swap bots in Drago by Knuckles, Sonic, and Jeffrey and his forces. And after Drago runs away, in the director's cut, we get to see Antoine and Bunny in the Down Under Airbus ore delivery. They hear a personal file entry on Ivo Robotnik, Oh, so Ivo is his name now. I thought that was his father's name. And it has Eggman bragging about his ultimate weapon, and I guess a pointless video diary that really can only be used against him. It's so weird, Eggman is constantly shown to flip-flop between being really smart and genre-savvy, and being a complete idiot for the sake of the plot. I like how they explain that the aura the ultimate weapon was irradiated, so it makes more sense. Antoine nervously suggests destroying the Airbus, which is pretty stupid considering they needed to get back home. But Bunny is smart enough to tell him not to be too hasty, and they lift off with the bus as she makes a stupid unnecessary pun about Crockpot, which I think is supposed to imply that they're going to get Crockpot destroyed with a bomb. I'm gonna give the comic the benefit of the doubt and assume that the airbus lifts off on its own, because someone other than Bunny was piloting it. Because otherwise I'd have to wonder why she was able to pilot it. Draco finally gets what he deserves, as he gets knocked out and gets bumped in the head by his own girlfriend. In the director's cut, they actually show a lot more of his abused girlfriend standing up to him, which feels so much more satisfying. I was so on her side, especially when she said that she had loved him and he had used her. I literally imagined voice acting for the scene for her, with her saying those lines passionately. That's how much I was enjoying this. And I like how she caught him off guard by making him think she was on his side at first. That was smart of her. Hershey, that's her name. Well, I think I'll remember that. I like those chocolate bars. I knew she would stand up to him. I was expecting that from the minute he told her everything, that she would go to the Freedom Fighters to reveal what was going on. It's just a shame she couldn't have done that sooner and cleared Sonic's name. I'm proud of Sonic for not getting mad at Hershey herself. Damn it, I almost called her Herschel. Robotnik learns that while his cargo from Down Under mentioned earlier has arrived, Sonic has liberated not a whole village. Eggman then proclaims that there can be only one point of view in the world, but the writers don't bother to have him explain what his point of view is at any point, so that was a missed opportunity. It sounds like he's an ideological villain, but he doesn't explain what his ideology is. Am I supposed to assume that his ideology is his racism against the non-humans? Cause that's- it seems like he just went on- went totally off topic there. We see Sonic running towards Eggman's base. He knows what the word modulate means. Granted, I can understand that at least because he hangs around a genius all the time. But why would Sonic of all people use the word modulate casually in a sentence? 
I guess he's smarter than you think. Anyways, he comes up with a plan that if he modulates the frequency of his speed while he runs really fast, according to Chuck's theories, he'll be able to create after images of himself to mess with his opponent. How can speed have frequency? It's not sound. It's not a wavelength. See, this is a new ability that makes sense with Sonic. You'll see a bullshit version of this later. So, is he confusing invisible cameras attached to every part of the base? Except how would he know about those? And he immediately burst into Eggman's base, so what was the point of that? He could have just run in immediately. Sonic says a badass comeback where he goes, You're right about one thing, Needle Nose. This is the last thing you'll ever do. It's full of seriousness and bitter hatred that feels so right coming from him at this point. And I hate him too, so I'm with him all the way on this as he grabs the rope and talks like he's going to finally kill him. Has he finally gotten a clue? He injures Snively with a method I have a hard time telling what he did at all because it's just a series of still images. And after Sonic briefly gets attacked and I wonder if he's facing an opponent, it turns out Bunny and H1 are here. And they're fortunately written well enough to be focused on defeating Robotnik rather than annoyingly hating on Sonic for what he was falsely accused of. Antoine says that he plans to place a bomb to sabotage Eggman's ultimate weapon. Where did they even get that? Also, the director's cut has a lot more of this scene for some reason. Then the director's cut has some more exclusive content, where Antoine and Bunny go to the war room and get to see the activation of the ultimate weapon before their very eyes. I don't really see the point of showing that, though. They're not going to do anything. Eggman, while shooting at Sonic, breaks that he's nullified his friend's vain attempt. Vain attempt? Eggman breaks that the confined space they're in prevents Sonic from making ultimate use of his speed. And after threatening the lives of everyone in Knothole because suddenly he doesn't give a shit about roboticizing them anymore, in the director's cut, we actually see Knothole get destroyed. Why the hell wasn't this in the original issue? That seemed pretty important. Otherwise, I mean, Sonic makes mention of not hoping but it's destroyed later, so I assumed originally that he was just talking about how the swap bots had rounded everyone up to roboticize them, and therefore it would be assumed that they would destroy not hole after that. I didn't think they literally got vaporized. Inch one is the one who destroys the ultimate weapon by simply plucking something with a radioactive sign on it that magically crosses the circuits in it indirectly. I say cross the circuits because that's what it's said to happen. A system crash prevented the weapon from working, as an electronic voice explains that cross circuits will result in internalized energy emission and the imminent destruction of the war room. It sure is convenient that Eggman was able to program this voice to say that in the case of something happening that he had no way of knowing would happen. A text blurb says that both Sonic and Eggman are conscious of their impending doom from the war room being about to explode. This was implied earlier from Sonic ordering Bunny and Antoine to set the bomb in the war room, even though he was going to fight Eggman anyways. After Sonic fights Robotnik without Robotnik having any battle armor to protect himself, making me wonder why Sonic hadn't killed him immediately without even trying, and then I assumed Robotnik's cyborg parts were just that tough. Sonic falls through a ring portal that came out of nowhere. I mean, he mounted his one billionth ring, so I don't see how he could have escaped from the mount. And then he suddenly feels so tired that he blacks out and collapses for some reason and wakes up in a medical facility back in Nuthole with Rotor and Dr. Quack tending to him. It was explained when Sonic was first found that he was found at Ground Zero, so he was assumed to need medical attention immediately. But if they're saying that, you'd think that they would be assuming from the sure fact that he's not in pieces from the explosion that he's totally unharmed by it. You can't be only somewhat hurt by the ultimate weapon. You'd either be magically immune to it or not. And then not whole being destroyed is magically explained away in a full shaft that makes no sense. Rotor says that not whole suddenly now exists in a temporal rift three hours in the future, almost like a zone of its own. The only thing that I can assume that happened is that by being shot by the ultimate weapon, it was sent three hours forwards in time. He also says that many zones were created when Robotnik unleashed his device. 
What device? The Annihilator? A device that was supposed to destroy things, not create them. This is the exact opposite of destroying things. He literally could not fail worse than that. So basically, Not Whole was sent three hours forwards in time, or the Annihilator created a portal and sucked Not Whole into it. Uh huh? Sonic serves as the perfect audience surrogate here because he's just as confused as the audience. But instead of explaining what Rotor just said properly, Dr. Quack just says that somehow, Sonic's pointless fight with Eggman had saved everyone. I never noticed him crossing circuits to destroy the Annihilator. Is that what saved everyone? Anyways, Dr. Quack explains his role in everything, starting with the revelation that Robotnik had detected his neutron chip the main component of the Dream Watcher, which I assume is the thing that Sonic used to talk to King Acorn, given that giant recap of what we already knew. But I thought that thing was called the Electro Celebrat or whatever. Not the Dream Watcher. It's a good name, but too little too late on the retcon there. So this is the explanation for how Robotnik found out about the King's return from exile. He had tuned in on the Dream Watcher after magically detecting it somehow and trace the location of Knothole from it because it was positioned in Knothole and I guess it had a GPS in it. I'm impressed that they actually tried to explain how he learned about the King's Return, but the explanation made no sense. How many bullshit assholes have been in this one issue alone? So many confusing new things that are just now being introduced. The Doctor explains that while Sonic was detained recovering the King's sword, Detained, that's a confusing term after Sonic's arrest. Way back in issue 43, to the point where I'm not really even sure what he's referring to, because I thought it was Knuckles who had gotten the Sword of Acorns. Robotnik has sent his Stormtroopers out to get the Doctor and the King, who he had replaced with a robot duplicate. Seriously, they got away with that? Ripping off the name of the Stormtroopers from Star Wars? I mean, isn't that like a trademark? Eggman explained to the Doctor that somehow, some way, his device was was key to his plans of revenge and world domination. Wait, revenge? Revenge for what? Eggman is seriously missing a fruity excuse here. He always has been. That's why I'm so damn desperate to get rid of him, or at least get a long break from him. He's so uncompelling as a villain. I have grown to appreciate just how many different ways that they managed to make him a straw man against industrialism. But he's he got no explanation for why he is the way he is. Just insulting. Then we get our time wasted as Dr. Quack talks for a few panels about stuff we already know. But fortunately, we get right back to new information as he explains that Snively had other plans. He had altered the Neutron Eradicator to affect only one organic pattern out of the many people originally programmed for it. Let me guess, it was Eggman. Good! Well, it's nice that Snively isn't inexplicably evil enough to want that many people to get killed, but two things wrong here. First, out of, and programmed. That implies that Eggman was one of the people included in his programming, and I doubt Eggman programmed the device to kill him, so why was his organic pattern even included? And second, I could only assume that organic pattern means DNA. It's a pretty intriguing way of describing DNA. But how the hell did Eggman get his hands on the organic pattern of literally every living being ever? Villains are too damn overpowered in this series. They can do just about anything the plot demands. Dr. Quack explains that he had Sally placed in a stasis tube for her to recover in that was disguised as some sort of fancy memorial. I can easily believe that stasis tube technology would exist because Sonic Adventure 2 had Shadow put 150 years ago, which I assume becomes canon to the comic later. But I still can't help but wonder how Citizen and Knothole got his hands on this ultra-advanced technology in a world ruined by Eggman where everyone is lucky they have anything at all. It feels like almost every text bubble in this room so far has been bullshit. But the whole... Knothole wasn't destroyed is the most bullshit of all. Because we saw Eggman find the place and destroy it. He's told that Sally's in a coma. 
But the comic immediately proved that it has better sense than very, very late into the comic with another coma patient, because Sally immediately wakes up the minute Sonic tells her that he loves her, instead of dragging it out depressingly so that she ends up never waking up. I can completely understand why Sonic said this to her, even if it does feel uncharacteristic and weird of Sonic the Hedgehog to say that to anyone, because I've never really seen him do this at all. Uh, but I can understand why he said this, because he had been worried sick about her for a while. He even thought that he lost her. So naturally that would tell him just how much he loves her. Naturally, once he sees her again, he'd be happy enough that this would just come out of him. And as if he's worried that if he doesn't say it now, he won't get another chance. Considering that she was smiling while infatuated, right when she woke up instead of being confused as hell, or angry at Sonic for supposedly cutting her rope and hurting her, I'm assuming that she actually did hear him say that and feel him kiss her, but was just too shy and proud to be honest about it. She just wanted to see if she could get him to say it again, but he didn't because it was a miracle he could get his proud self to admit even once, let alone say it to her face. I think it's kind of sweet, a little. And this is coming from someone who doesn't support Sonic and Sally as a couple. Why would I? They're complete opposites. One's careful, the other isn't. It's just not gonna work out! Nevertheless, I'm still happy for them because I like both of them as characters. So I'm happy for them because they're happy and have achieved their goals. This means I'm going to support them in their relationship for one of the same reasons that I support Bunny and Antoine. So I'm not gonna constantly complain about them being together like a Debbie Downer. I'll just say this, I can't wait for the breakup, because I am hyped as hell to see Sonic and Sally with someone other than each other for once, just to see if, they'd, just to see if they'd hilariously turn out to be better with some other love interest that they're not being shoved into. We had a small hint of that with Sally and Jeffrey, but it was so rare and out of focus that it didn't really matter. But back to the important thing, the last thing Sally saw before getting hurt and blacking out was Sonic cutting her rope so that she'd fall. And now I'm expected to believe that when she sees him again, her reaction is not to be terrified and angry at him. This would be fine if they made it clear that she didn't remember what had happened. It does make sense, people tend to lose their memory of what happened right before getting knocked out by hits of the head. This is because the brain doesn't have enough time to solidify the short-term memory into a long-term one before the unconsciousness happens. And you could argue that Sally had gotten a head injury, since she probably hit the back of her head on the landing. But still, they should have explained that, because this reaction is insultingly unrealistic. Also, exclusive to the director's cut is Sonic kissing Sally again. And since it's an entire page, and specials aren't as limited in page space, it makes sense that they couldn't include this in the original story. Plus, it was just a waste of time. It's explained that order was finally restored, with Dr. Quack fortunately not being punished for being forced to do the things he did. Seriously though, this, this was supposed to be the last issue ever, and they still haven't uncrystallized the king? Huh? That seems like an odd thing to forget to resolve. And Hershey was also forgiven for being duped, and is now a model citizen. Good. I feel pretty sorry for Jeffrey here, he looks so depressed. It makes perfect sense, considering the way he chased after Sonic like he was a criminal, and not to mention never got along with him even before that, and won't afterwards either. He must feel awful. Now maybe he's just sad about Sally choosing someone else over him, but I can imagine that's only part of the reason. It's explained that Jeffrey was reinstated as commander of the King's Secret Service, back to his rightful position in life. And we see Bunny kiss Antoine the cheek, which is pretty adorable to see. I'm really glad they're together. I'm glad it's finally revealed that it wasn't just a one-off thing, and that they actually did start dating finally. And let me tell you, I like Bunny a lot more as Antoine's girlfriend than as simply a bland, nice girl with not much of a personality. The root problem with her still hasn't been resolved, but at least she's now she's in regularly situations where she looks really sympathetic, and makes Antoine more sympathetic by being Antoine's girlfriend. The Freedom Fighters welcomed their friend Sonic back with open arms. Oh, that's good. That's sweet. This is such a happy ending. It almost makes me forgive the issue for being so damn confusing. Almost. Draco got what he deserved, being given a life sentence to the very same terrible prison that Sonic was going to be sent to. So that's an ironic punishment there. Still, I have no fucking clue why they aren't just killing him. 
especially since the death penalty was mentioned earlier, and the only reason Sonic was spared was supposed favoritism. Why wasn't Drago given that penalty for committing high treason? I mean, he could have potentially gotten Sally killed with his plan. So why wasn't he given the same punishment for attempted murder of her? I can't even say that the out of universe reason is that they want to save him to use him as a villain again, because at least from what I've heard, this was supposed to be the final issue. Unfortunately, the story ends on a bit of a downer, as it's explained that Snively is still at large. Well, at least now he can have his time to shine. Here's to hoping it'll take a decent amount of time for Eggman to be brought back, because I need a break from him like you wouldn't believe. This story was written by, oh boy, this is a doozy. Ken Pender is for pages 1 to 3 and 22 to 27. Mike Gallagher for just pages 4 to 9. Carl Bowler, who I don't recognize, for pages 10 to 15. And finally, Kent Taylor for pages 16 to 21. I guess the point of all these writers is that they were really excited by the supposed finale and wanted to have all the writers chip in for a celebration. That really oozes love and passion for the comic. But the thing is, it's not all of the writers. But I guess if they had too many writers, it'd feel like a mess because it went through one's consistent style. It's amazing enough that all of these different writers didn't make the story feel like it was drastically shifting in tone or writing style multiple times. Somehow, it managed to come out to me as if it was just written by one person. Anyways, despite the happy ending, the story ended with me feeling unsatisfied. And the reason is probably related to the giant amount of confusing ass pulls in the story. The thing that angers me the most is the ridiculous explanation for how Knothole avoided being destroyed. I mean, they could have just not had it be destroyed at all and it wouldn't have been confusing. Now on its own, Knothole being in a mystical temporal zone where it's three hours into the future is a concept that fascinates me to no end. I love that concept, it's so cool. It gives an interesting tactical advantage to the Freedom Fighters because if they're going to be attacked by a whole army or something, I can assume they'll have three hours to deal with it. Or maybe it doesn't work like that and the army will be able to come to hold just fine, at which point the three hour thing or the temporal rift thing won't really help anyone at all, it will be entirely pointless. But it sounds cool at least. The problem is that they introduced this concept in just one panel and one text box, instead of it becoming the case over a long story arc or something. And I'm confusingly told that somehow, the ultimate weapon that was only programmed for destroying Robotnik, thanks to Snively, somehow had other effects to it, where it created a whole bunch of new zones and put an hole in a new zone that saved it from being destroyed. How could this have happened unintentionally? I'm imagining here the Knothole got swallowed up into a portal to a pocket dimension. Okay, that's fine. I wish it had been less confusing. And do you know what the most frustrating part is? The whole not hoping in a pocket dimension thing would have perfectly explained why Eggman hasn't found all hole yet. This should have been the case from the very beginning of the comic. All those times where I asked why he hasn't found the place with satellite imaging or flying cameras, all that would have been resolved if it was in a pocket dimension the whole time, with its portal being hidden in that stump that Sonic uses as the entrance to the underground hideout. You know, that concept I loved since I read those early issues in Sonic Mega Collection, and then was confused and annoyed at it being totally forgotten about in favor of huts above ground. Anyways, I'm glad the whole thing worked out. Robotnik being taken out at last, and I love the happy ending. Sonic being welcomed back to his friends with open arms. Don't care either way about Sonic and Sally getting together though, I could take it or leave it. But I'm not really complaining. I'm not that petty. I just wish Jeffrey had the heart to actually apologize to Sonic for treating him like a criminal instead of leaving me still mad at him. Granted, it wasn't his fault. It wasn't anyone's fault. Sonic's friends had every reason to believe Sonic was guilty. Well, aside from the obvious fact that they should have assumed it was a fake Sonic who did it at this point. I love Dr. Quack's role in the whole story. The Robot King duplicate was brilliant. Drago was a great villain to the point where I don't really mind him not having fruit and excuse for it. I mean, it makes sense, like, villains don't necessarily have to have fruity and excuses. People can be jerks without having a tragic past to explain it. It would just be nice. So I love the story in general. The plot points are pretty intriguing and engaging. I just, I just wish the issue wasn't so confusing at times. 
The beginning was so damn confusing to the point where I wasn't really invested because I was so distracted by my confusion. And honestly, I hate how, at least in the original story, Bunny and Antoine's part in it, and the entire reason the ultimate weapon was stopped, and the reason Sonic thinks No Hole was destroyed, all that was confined to the director's cut released later. And that all seems pretty important. Why the hell did issue 50 as a non-special even exist? Why didn't they just release it as a special right away if it's so important and not even bother with the gimped original version? Well, I guess they made more money that way. Next up is issue 51, and I'm really excited to see what it's going to be like, because th this is the first issue after Eggman's supposed getting destroyed. 